Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, this is a great venue. This, uh, as Johnny said and as Matt said, we're very honored uh, to be a platinum sponsor. Uh, this is, I think, a great event, a great forum to just bring everyone together. And what you're going to hear about in my talk today is how we uh, really leverage those partnerships and those collaborations and really move us forward, not only in what we're trying to do in the quantum community, but towards our goals as the Air Force. Uh, first off, uh, you probably noticed from the early programs, I'm subbing today for uh, my boss, Colonel Tim Lawrence. Uh, fortunately, Colonel Lawrence couldn't be here today. He had to stay back in Rome, New York, uh, taking care of some uh, issues and hot stuff in the information directorate. So, so we miss him. He sends his best, and uh, he was here last year. Hopefully, he'll be here next year as well. But huge supporter of our quantum program. We wouldn't be where we are today uh, without him. So with that, let me talk a little bit about Air Force Research Lab. And the point of my talk today is really, if you were here last year for General Cooley's talk, some of these slides uh, may look familiar, but I know a lot of the audience is new as this conference continues to grow. So I really wanted to uh, just take the beginning of the talk and really look at what we're doing across all of AFRL, as it's more than just quantum computing, but whatever we're doing in other areas of quantum information science, it certainly influences and leverages, allows us to leverage uh, those technology advancements. So AFRL as a whole, uh, it's the primary research and development arm of the Air Force. Uh, we're headquartered at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, we were created in 1997 through the merger of four super labs. For example, you may know the information director in Rome as Rome Laboratory or Rome Labs, as that's a name we're commonly known by and often referred to in the press that way as well. Overall, AFRL has over 11,000 employees, uh, counting military, government, and contract positions. Uh, our budget, you can see it laid out there. We're well over, we're on the order of about $6 billion or so. Uh, and really, we also get a lot of customer funding. So again, the partnerships and collaborations really come into play, and we'll talk a lot about those throughout the talk. Uh, as we'll see on the next slide or so, we're located in many different states, as well as our international sites in three countries, which are really so critical and so paramount, especially these days, and in very much so in quantum information science. A little bit about our breakout. Uh, I won't spend too much time on these slides, but we talked about the 11,000 11, employees, uh, very much focused on science and engineering. So we see we're really driven towards performing that mission and uh, you know, keeping the fight unfair. 70% uh, of our scientists and engineers uh, have a master's degree with a much uh, higher percentage than 30%, so about 36% or so have a PhD as well. Uh, also, you know, we can't get our mission done without the business side of things as well. It's so paramount, and especially in Rome, where I come from, it's so critical in uh, taking care of things and allowing things to get on contract and to be able to partner with uh, so many different agencies out there. So the Air Force strategy. So yes, we do have a strategy. We've developed this over the last two years. Uh, you know, I loved uh, all of the sports references that Matt made in his talk. I'm a huge sports guy, uh, for those who don't know me. Uh, and especially love the uh, Wayne Gretzky quote. I use that quote all the time, that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Uh, very true. Sometimes we feel like uh, more so not just having the solid strategy, but more so like uh, you know, the Miami play there, uh, where we're just kind of running around. But really, we do have a strategy. And what we really are looking towards is, you know, the field is moving very quickly. Everyone here realizes that. And things are maturing much more quickly uh, than anyone even imagined a few years ago. Uh, we're look, getting to the point where we can start, and I'll talk a little bit about this, where we can start moving things from the lab out into the field, not making them operational, but just at the prototype stage and just seeing how things will perform. Uh, our strategy includes all four, what we call four aspects of quantum information science, timing, sensing, computing, uh, communications, and networking uh, grouped together, those last two. Uh, for the midterm, we see timing and sensing as having near breakthroughs, um, early opportunities to take things from the lab, maybe make them operational. As we just heard in Professor Preskill's talk, you know, quantum computing uh, is a ways out, right, to have error-corrected quantum computing. It, it's going to be, you know, decades or so before we get there, but we are in it for the long haul. And also certainly love the quote from Chris Monroe that it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we, we are fully uh, realizing that, and we are definitely in it for the long haul. Uh, the last key point here is we're informing, leveraging, 
DOD, government, academic industry, and international efforts. So bringing all of those together, uh, we're all in on quantum across AFRL. We've done a number of things recently that have really strengthened our foothold in that area. Of course, coming back to Q2B is a big part of that. Uh, I encourage you to, as we go through this talk today and you see certain aspects of it that are you know, interesting to you, to stop by our booth. We have a large contingent here today of our scientists and engineers who can help answer your questions, help point you in the right direction. So that's been a big part of you know, why we're here, is working on those partnerships. But also at the broader sense and the larger aspect, uh, working with uh, other government agencies, being at the highest levels in terms of influencing and being a part of developing national strategy. So we've been very fortunate to be a part of OSTP and sit on a couple of key committees there uh, under the National Quantum Initiative. Uh, and internationally, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but as we move forward, you know, we can't go at it alone. It's going to take key international partners as well, given all of the uh, work that's being done internationally. Now across AFRL, I mentioned those nine different geographic sites. It also maps into that we have nine different technology directorates. You can see them laid out there. I won't spend time going through each of those different directorates in terms of what they do. But what I will point out, though, is that we have six different directorates, and those are the two-letter acronyms there, uh, that work on different aspects of quantum information science. So, for example, in New Mexico at our Space Vehicles and Directed Energy Directorates, uh, we're doing things like quantum uh, communications uh, in terms of satellite networking and communications. Uh, in RV, the Space Vehicles Directorate, position, navigation, and timing is really what's being worked on there. If you think of that as the clocks and the sensing piece to quantum information science. In our uh, Wright Patterson location and materials directorate, RX, uh, materials development. So things like diamond color centers, supply chain management, materials development, uh, materials simulation, all very much of interest. And in the sensors directorate, going back to uh, some of those devices as well, uh, laser development, quantum emitters, uh, things like that, really the foundational pieces that we need to uh, further develop uh, higher level things such as our sensors and our clocks. And finally in Rome, we'll talk about that later on, but we do the computing piece, uh, communications and network. And we'll get into this later on, but definitely on the computing piece, we're all in on algorithm and software development, as you'll see. Uh, in terms of breaking out those areas, uh, Four key areas, timing, sensing, communications, networking, and computing. You can see some of the application areas there. Uh, really, the first two, timing and sensing, what we're really driving towards there in terms of our main driver is self-sustained PNT. If you lose GPS, can you still have navigation and timing? And we very much need that in the Air Force, uh, so we're very much driving towards that, and we think quantum can be a big enabler of that. Uh, so certainly with clocks, fewer timing updates it'll allow us for t also to have time transfer between platforms, which allow coherent uh, electronic warfare, improved navigation, of course, uh, and ISR, uh, intelligent surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, same thing with sensing, fits in, you know, bring those pieces together. We'll talk a little bit later on about how we're doing that on the international stage. Uh, networking, once again, uh, being able to develop that quantum network, uh, not only at, uh, say, the ground level or the air-to-ground level, but also how you get to space and how you can communicate safely uh, and securely uh, without being tampered, uh, tamper-evident, tamper-resistant uh, in space as well, very much of interest. And really, you know, when you think of the computing era, when you have small, you know, even NISC and a little bit beyond that, you know, how you can tie those computers together, and we view that as distributed computing. Uh, a key part of this are those enabling technologies being developed and also the workforce development. You know, I can't stress enough is being able to develop, train a uh, qualified workforce as we move forward is, is very critical and it's a tough uh, market out there, lots of high demands out there. Uh, so we're doing our part as well to foster and develop the workforce as well. Bigger picture, this is called our operational view or OV1. Uh, color-coded, uh, the colors match up there to the circle you'll see uh, on your left-hand side here. So timing, sensing, uh, communications, and computing. 
Uh, if we go clockwise here, we see timing and sensing, of course, as being our more near-term applications with networking and communications, computing, all being a little further out. But the applications are highlighted there, uh, and as I said, they go with the colors. So if you first think of your, your clocks and your sensing, of course, that uh, unaided inertial navigation is something that we're very interested in. Uh, as well as picosecond time transfer between different platforms. We're able to take a series of smaller apertures and really combining them and, and phasing them together so you can have one larger a, uh, aperture and give you much higher resolution than you could have classically, is something that we're very interested in. On the communication side, we talked about that network already, but ground-based as well as air, as well as space putting all those pieces together. It really gives us this low probability of intercept communications, uh, tamper evident, tamper proof uh, communications as well. So you can see we have a number of applications in mind where quantum could really play a key role. I'll now step through those uh, as well uh, in the next series of slides. Um, what we'll do in these next uh, five slides is really show, I'll set these all up because they're set up uh, a similar way. Uh, and the bottom piece of it in the rectangles are really the capabilities that we envision getting this out. Uh, and the top part is the technology kind of breakthroughs and technology steps, if you will, the iterations that we need to take in order to be there. So example, in timing, if you look at our clocks uh, these days, uh, for example, clocks that are in GPS, uh, stability is in the order of a nanosecond per day under static conditions, uh, takes several updates per day uh, to stay synchronized. We need to move past that. So we're working on developing clocks with better stability for those applications that we've talked about, realizing uh, that you know, once you start increasing the uh, stability, you then have to take a step back, and that's why the volume uh, increases there. So it'll take work there to get there. Uh, one thing to point out there as well, in terms of moving clocks out in the field, is uh, under an OSD program, we're working with Dr. Paul Lapata in terms of you know, how we, can we take some of the work being done under the DARPA ACES program and you know, possibly transition that out or take it to the next step in terms of making it fieldable and practical and be able to do things like this. So with our objectives there, obviously, we want to move from several updates per day to uh, clocks that could hold time for weeks to a month and then really move towards this much more precise and accurate timing. Uh, in terms of time scale here, um, it's uh, kind of left, left vague there as well. A lot will depend on technology breakthroughs, but certainly midterm concept, we're envisioning anywhere from 10 to 15 years out uh, and longer term, you know, uh, 15 plus years out. But they can all be accelerated and it all depends, you know, how well the technology continues to develop. And certainly for the different technology areas we envision, you know, those things probably moving along quicker. For example, clocks as well. Uh, GPS denied environments, uh, we show here on the bottom, uh, inertial navigation system, pretty large uh, strategic type system that would go on, say, a naval ship. Uh, right now, uh, they can only hold accuracy for about an hour or so before they need to be refreshed. So pretty big systems. We need to be able to take that down and get GPS-like accuracy for greater than an hour uh, in the near midterm. And then obviously, as we go longer, longer duration flights, different types of scenarios that we have in, uh, in mind and envisioning, we need to be on the order of multiple hours as well. So improved uh, sensors uh, is something that you know, ties together with the clocks. And in fact, we have formed a uh, PNT strategic challenge. Um, this is something that General Cooley, in partnership with Admiral Hahn of the Navy, uh, have come up with and they're bringing together international partners as well. So it's called our Five Eyes Partners. So in addition to the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are all partnering together to develop and look at how can we take quantum-inspired technologies from the lab, move them out into the field in a ship, in an actual real ship, in an exercise on the 2022 timeframe. So this will be demonstrated uh, at what's called the RIMPAC uh, exercise in the Pacific Rim uh, in 2022. We're hard at work on that. It's involving lots of partnerships. I can you know, just tell you some of the technologies. So certainly we've talked about the clocks, uh, gradiometers, gravimeters, magnetometers, uh, gyros, you know, things that you would imagine that you could use uh, to have uh, navigation 
without GPS. So all the partners are bringing together those different technologies. A key part of that, and I'll tell you, is the backend uh, architecture where you fuse those technologies together. Uh, we're developing at AFRL and our sensors director are developing an architecture that can take those technologies in an open architecture fashion. I really envision it as a plug and play type system where you can drop those technologies in and then you know, really fuse the data, take the data, uh, and get something meaningful out of it. Obviously, 2022 is just around the corner, a few years away. We have very uh, you know, different levels of tech maturity. So how we bring those together in 2022 is going to be a very much a challenge. Uh, one might imagine it'll go from optical bench to waveforms and, and a moving ship. And you know, having limited access to it during the exercise is going to be a challenge. So we envision this as being steps. 2022 is our first time out. And 2024, you know, we really hope to learn from 2022 and make meaningful improvements after that. So lots more to come on that. I hope in future years we'll continue to update you on where we're at. But you know, once again, moving quantum technology out and really showing its usefulness uh, in these key areas. Quantum networks, uh, obviously a lot of talk about QKD and what it can do for security. In the Air Force, we see that as a near-term payoff, but we're, we're moving well past that. And in fact, you know, QKD is really not something we're interested in uh, right now, maybe only as a tech step. But really going forward, quantum entanglement and really moving towards the ultimate goal of a global scale uh, quantum entangled network. Uh, you know, maybe where we can talk about those uh, apertures uh, and having the smaller apertures eventually building up to a larger atmosphere or a larger atmosphere to give us a lot of different types of precision and sensing that we can't have right now. So very much under development uh, in terms of, you know, what entanglement will bring to the field, bring to the game. But we really see, you know, communications as moving towards that uh, type of application. Uh, what we're doing right now in that area, uh, this is work being done by Dr. Mark Grunheisen down at uh, Directed Energy. So Mark's been working on um, ground to space transmission, 24-7 operation, just has a really nice paper out on that right now. And the um, different types of apertures that he can use within that. Uh, to be able to operate in those 24-7 type environments. So super work there. We're in the early stages of uh, signing up to partner with Canada on this to have an uh, international agreement in terms of you know, bringing Mark's technology to the game, some of the work we're doing in Rome, as well as you know, what the Canadians can provide as well. So lots of uh, new developments on that, and I think this is going to be a really nice partnership for us uh, moving forward as well. Uh, getting into some of the work that we do in Rome in the Information Directorate where I'm based, uh, this is our ground and air-based quantum networking program. You see a lot of different pieces there. Uh, right now, we have about two nodes set up in the lab, and by nodes, I mean ion traps. So we're working on Euterbium-based ion traps. Uh, this is a relatively new setup over the last few years that we were able to develop. We're actually moving towards some new species uh, other than Euterbium. Uh, we hope to have some results on that in the next uh, year or so. But for right now, we're working on Euterbium, uh, providing that memory node in a network. Obviously, in a network, you need those memory nodes. So we see you know, ourselves and ion traps as being a key part of that. Uh, going along with that is a quantum. You can see the quantum circuit labeled there. That's our quantum photonic processor. Uh, also work that we're doing in conjunction with the DOD Manufacturing Institute, the AIM Manufacturing Institute, which has been just a tremendous resource and partnership for us. Uh, that's headquartered just down the road from us in Albany, New York, as well as Rochester, New York, and really allowing us to move from bulk optics, fibers, all over a four by eight optical table into a small quantum integrated circuit. You see, if you visit our booth, as a matter of fact, you can see a large wafer of that, of the different pieces and different components that we have on there. Uh, not only stuff we're doing in Rome, things we're doing in Rome, but our other partners as well uh, throughout the U.S. who have you know, bought into that wafer and have uh, 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 different functionalities on that wafer. So you can see where we're going towards this, or our, our goal is to move from the lab out into the field. We have uh, the two spots on your right are our Stockbridge test site, and this is really you know, how we can field test some of this work. So it's a 300-acre site we have in Stockbridge, New York, about 18 miles southeast, southwest uh, from the Rome site. Uh, we have UAV, small UAV test capabilities there as well. So we envision you know, being able to create this air-to-ground optical node. And really, you know, it's going to be challenging, but certainly what we have here in um, um, Q2B 
as well as under the QEDC, especially under QEDC, is you know, how we can work on taking that technology, shrinking the technology, shrinking the ion traps, making them fieldable, making them deployable, and getting to a more practical network. So we have a very stepwise approach to that that we're taking. Uh, another thing to point out here, we have some new partners that we're going to be working with uh, through Brookhaven National Labs as well as Stony Brook, and really looking at how we can develop a fiber-based network throughout New York State. So there's going to be more to come on this. Uh, the technology is certainly not at the maturity point right now that we can just roll out a network, but this is something that Colonel Lawrence is pushing us hard on, and uh, you know, within the next year or so, we expect to have some very uh, succinct goals laid out as to how we're going to marry the technologies being developed by uh, Dr. Eden Figueroa down uh, at Stony Brook with the technologies that we're developing with our team as well. Um, the last point to, to point out here on this slide certainly is some of our superconducting work as well. Uh, Dr. Matt LaHaye is working that for us, just joined us from Syracuse University, and really looking at how we can interface the different species, different technologies uh, all together as well. Uh, last slide here on what we're doing is our algorithm side. So I talked about the quantum computing piece and the algorithm development, how we're all in on this. Uh, this has been very evident. Uh, I'll have a slide on this later on, but this, during this past year, we just started a partnership with IBM to be one of their uh, networking network hubs. But the, the main point to get across here, and it, it dovetails very nicely with what Professor Preskill said, is you know, developing those types of algorithms, you know, continue developing those algorithms, and Matt mentioned it as well. We really need, and we, we really see a, a need for that, very much a pressing need, as to, to develop those algorithms. Uh, big part here is that we at AFRL don't develop the quantum computing hardware. We, we leave it to the bigger commercial players out there, uh, such as the IBMs, the Googles, the D-Waves, and the uh, INQs, and the startups such as Rigetti. You know, places that have a lot of uh, resources and a lot of expertise in it. So then the question is, how do we best leverage that? So using you know, cloud-based access to those machines is something we're very interested in. And we continue to develop partnerships. We're growing our internal team and also developing partnerships with external uh, collaborators to have access to those machines. Uh, you'll have a talk tomorrow by Dan Koch going to more detail on some of our results with the IBM machine. but. Um, you know, really here, I think I, I hit upon all those main points, but really, you know, the usual types of problems that we're looking at squarely in line with the Air Force, uh, optimization problems, uh, machine learning problems, and certainly um, quantum simulation for things like uh, materials discovery and uh, things that you could go, go with that on the, on the simulation side as well. So very robust and growing program for us in this area. Our team is here. They'll be happy to talk to you at the booth on this as well. A little bit on the IBM partnership. So we just, uh, you may have seen the press on this, we're very proud uh, to be partnering with IBM on this and becoming a hub in their network. I think it's a great partnership. IBM is located not too far away from us geographically, so it makes a lot of sense for us to work with IBM and also given the fact that they are a true leader in this area. You can see some of the different uh, connectivities and the different chips out there, but what we're really looking to do is develop this collaborative environment. And the thing to point out here as well, so we have our AFRL researchers working on this uh, hub, but we also are expanding out. So we're looking for partners, we're looking for the right partners to help us work on these Air Force type problems, the ones I laid out before, the optimization problems, the machine learning, uh, the quantum simulation. So if you're interested, please get with myself, uh, Steve Johns, the rest of our team here, and we can talk further about you know, if this makes sense for us to uh, work together on this as well. But really exciting partnership, just kind of getting up and rolling right now. Uh, so I think uh, it's gonna be something that uh, you know, is really gonna really grow and blossom. To go into uh, you know, our, our a little deeper into our research goals, I think this does a really nice job in terms of where we are today and you know, the different areas uh, that we're looking at. So fundamentals and benchmarking, you'll hear about this in the talk tomorrow, but really looking at the, the connectivity and you know, its implications for constructing larger circuits out of that. Low def circuits, how we can look at uh, you know, maximizing the success on smaller algorithms and looking at different types of connectivity and geometries for that. The machine learning, I've, I've mentioned machine learning obviously is playing a large role in the Air Force of the future and where we're going with that in terms of applications to AI. So what can quantum bring to the game there as well? The QAOA, which we heard a little bit about early on, very much interest to us in terms 
of our logistics problems, our, say, munitions deliveries, uh, our troop transports, our, our air assets, all those things that you can imagine in command and control scenarios, you know, can we optimize it uh, using quantum technology? Uh, the material discovery, certainly be able to characterize and effectively model uh, different molecules are out there. They're very much of interest to us. We're currently working with NASA and Google in this area in our materials directorate. So uh, I think that's a real near-term NIST type application for us as well. And finally, going back to the workforce development and educational training, uh, you know, expected announcement on this pretty soon, but we definitely uh, you know, see ourselves as being leaders in this, trying to train the workforce. And then we have a very robust intern program as well in our quantum group. So summer faculty, interns, and then eventually some of those turn into full-time hires, not only for us, but other DOD agencies as well. You can see a list of our collaborators here. Uh, these are people who are specifically working with on the quantum algorithms, a whole array. We expect this list to, uh, to grow. And I apologize if there's anyone in the audience who's not listed here uh, that we are working with. We'll, we'll make sure we update the slide, but this does seem to change almost weekly for us. Uh, and this will continue to grow as I get to our uh, next slide here. So one of the big, big things that we're doing in Rome is this open innovation environment, our open innovation campus. We've just recently changed the name to open innovation campus, so OIC. Uh, what this is, is this is really transforming how we do our business practices within the Air Force. So if anyone follows the, the 2030, Air Force 2030 strategy, or hears Dr. Roper speak, or General Golfing, you'll see that the Air Force definitely needs to go out and do things differently. Uh, and really that's formed through partnerships and collaborations. And what we're really looking for is, uh, you know, how we can do things outside of our gate, uh, outside of our, you know, uh, what we call our security perimeter as well. Because right now, to be honest, it's very hard to be able to come in as an outside researcher and work for us, uh, especially if you're an international partner. So what we're doing, and this is in partnership with New York State, uh, as well as the county that we're in, as Nida County, is developing this open innovation campus. And it's a $12 million partnership that the state and county are put money in to renovate a building for us, 40,000 square feet three floors that'll be dedicated to this type of uh, innovation development. Really envision it, if I could you know, just kind of put it in a nutshell, we would see it as a technology magnet for uh, acceleration of technology and talent uh, and encompassing all of that and bringing it all together. So what is it really? It's, I talked about those three floors. Part of the first floor, we're gonna have two state-of-the-art quantum labs, so hard quantum labs. Uh, where we'll be working on our networking and communication technologies. Uh, the third floor will be this more open collaborative area, and that's where we're really going to be developing a lot of our um, quantum algorithms and bringing teammates together uh, and pooling them together, putting them in this kind of area that uh, will really help, you know, in terms of proximity, developing or accelerating uh, the technology there. Uh, so this ecosystem, I think, is just uh, you know, going to be the start of it for what we do. Uh, the renovations have started. They just started a couple months ago or last month. Uh, we expect a certificate of occupancy in the May 2020 timeframe. We'll be in there soon after. So we really expect this summer to start ramping up in there. Uh, I think we are going to have some good news on our budget soon as well, so that will allow us to, to really ramp up the quantum labs in there and really make them state-of-the-art. And That's something that Colonel Lawrence is so big on is, you know, we want to make these labs attractive so that folks want to work with us. Uh, we have great facilities right now inside our perimeter. We have absolute, some of you have seen them, absolutely state-of-the-art uh, facilities. Uh, now we take that outside and bring in partners as well you know, uh, under you know, the right sets of agreements. And this is more than just a quantum area. I should point out this is all for our information directorate where we do command control, communications, uh, computing, uh, and intelligence work as well as cyber work. So really bringing a lot of those things together, talking a little bit about it on the next page. I won't go through this, uh, but this really just shows, this eye chart just shows the different stakeholders and how we see these partnerships coming together. Um, we have a lot of partners uh, who've expressed a strong interest in this. We'll be working in the next six months on formalizing a strategy for the Open Innovation Campus. We're doing this in partnership uh, with SUNY, who's been just a great partner for us. They're going to have presence in the building as we go forward as well. So the strategy's coming, the facility's coming, 
Uh, if you're interested in it, if you want to learn more about it, we have a series of challenge problems that we've put out there. Our chief engineer has worked with our different uh, tech leads and looking at some of the initial interest areas, not only in quantum, but across all of uh, the information director and the different technologies that we're interested in. So it's, it's finding the right technologies for the partners and then as well as coming up with the right mechanism and the right agreement to work on that. So with that, uh, I think I'm ending just pretty much right on time here. Uh, we really see quantum information silence uh, as you know, the 2035 timeframe enabling a whole lot of different outcomes, near term timing, sensing that we talked about, stay tuned for things on the uh, PNT challenge, and then uh, communications, networking, and algorithms, right? Uh, going back to that quote by Professor Monroe, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And as a runner, and I, could, I can appreciate that. We're in it for the long haul, but uh, AFRL is all in. As Matt said, let me just conclude on that. You know, I talked about Q2B. We are a member now of uh, the QEDC. That's been a really big, I think that's going to be a real game changer for us in AFRL. It's going to allow us, again, to develop co-projects uh, with some of the members of QEDC out there and really accelerate uh, our technology as well. Um, combined with our open innovation campus, I think the future is bright for AFRL. Uh, with that, I will end. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm interested. When did you start doing anything with quantum computing? Okay, that's, that's a great question. I can actually step through that because it was started back when I was had a small branch. Uh, so back in uh, about 2005 or so, we started looking at you know what quantum computing is and just having some small research contracts. About the 2008-9 time frame, we started looking at uh, photonic techniques for quantum computing. And so that was our first step into that. We started setting up some labs in that area. We had some uh, existing photonic expertise, so we started building upon that. And then uh, that continued to grow. And a few years after that, we jumped into the networking technology, the communications technology. Uh, and, and I should say, you know, this is specific to what we've done in Rome. But other directorates across AFR have been pretty similar. Some of the clockwork has been going on probably even longer for that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's ramped up, there's no doubt about that. And I should say to AFOSR, which is the basic funding agency for the Air Force, uh, they've certainly had a long heritage in, in funding these technologies, but uh, the funding stream has continued to grow in that as well. And certainly for us, we've added a lot of personnel within the last few years, uh, being part of uh, OSD program allowed us to grow our personnel as well as grow a lot of our facilities. So it's been, a, I'd say, a, a ramp up but it's definitely accelerated the last few years as well. Anything else? Question right there. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned uh, on the quantum communication stuff that uh, QKD is kind of a near-term thing and you're moving towards distributed entanglement. Can you speak a little bit more to the kind of applications you see for that? Uh, yeah, uh, so I think a lot of those applications are, are really theoretical now is, is what we're seeing. I talked about, you know, linking kind of that space network together. We'll be partnering, actually collaborating with NIST and NASA uh, starting in January uh, in terms of you know, how we can maybe put a program together on that and putting, say, clocks in space, and that's maybe the first part of it, and then how can you bring entanglement to it with uh, communications technologies. But certainly things like time transfer between platforms are of interest to us, uh, as well as, you know, that uh, high resolution aperture, uh, space object detection, things like that, that, um, you know, are, are in theory right now, and we, you know, time will tell if they'll be able to prove out. So uh, the entanglement piece is something we're very interested in, but definitely a lot of unknowns at this point. Mm -hmm.